Hi, welcome to uh, our next session as part of your uh, NET English training program. Um, in case you haven't been following the other sessions, uh, my name is Nathan Corfey. I'm part of the, uh, the director team for English. And our session today is uh, session eight uh, from all sides now, writing persuasively. So we're going to focus on particularly persuasive techniques and the different text types uh, for persuasive writing. And I'll just explain to you now a very quick overview of the session that we'll run through today. Okay, so there are three main areas we want to focus on in this session. Uh, we're exploring the craft of persuasive writing. So how do we um, enable and equip the students we teach to become really, really expert um, writers? So there's a variety of genres we want to focus on. So what are the various nonfiction text types? Um, how important are these text types? How different are they? Uh, we want to focus on the features of persuasive writing. Um, which ones are uh, important? Is there a hierarchy to them? And how do we actually and practically teach them? Uh, and finally, how do we make it persuasive writing engaging for students and find different ways in uh, to enable students to access them as well? So let's start with the different text types uh, that you might have students write in. Now, obviously, there's a whole range of text types. Um, but they, they tend to fall into four main characters, uh, char char categories, I apologize, categories, um, which you can call laser as an acronym, but it's letter, article, speech, report. And these are kind of umbrella terms for many different types of writing. So, for example, you may have a formal or informal letter, but you might also have an email and, and you may want to focus on that for a session with students. Um, articles. These can be magazine articles, they could also be newspaper articles, and then of course within newspaper articles you can have tabloids, uh, you can have broadsheet, and we'd want students to understand the differences and nuances between them. Uh, speeches, and again you can have formal informal speeches, uh, uh, and obviously the context is very very important there, and that links into our year eight scheme on speeches as well, which you might bring into. Um, and finally, reports. And again, this might be seen as the kind of the lesser younger brother of the, the rest of them that we don't often focus on, but reports can include things like reviews, so movie reviews, book reviews, um, as well as kind of informative writing as well. Now, obviously there are, as we've said, a range of different text types, but that's not really the important thing. Uh, when we get particularly at GCSE level, what examiners will tell you, particularly in AQA, is that the text type isn't really important. What's important is the actual quality of the writing, um, the, the use of persuasive features. That's what we're looking for. So text types really, the, the main difference you'll find is the opening and the closing. The actual body of the, the content will uh, re really kind of stay the same. Um, so for example, for a letter, dear, name, comma, ending with yours sincerely or yours faithfully, is really the only difference between that and an article where an article would begin with a, a headline or, or a title. Um, speeches would probably begin with good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or depending on the audience. Um, and again, thank you for listening uh, to finish or close. And then reports, just like articles, would probably have a, a title, but the title would be less lively um, and more informative. So really, those are our main text types. Um, and as I've said, that's not really the important thing. We do want them to have cultural capital. We want them to understand the formatting of a letter, um, but we're not going into loads of detail on what side does the address go. Um, what we're more focused on is, as I've said, the quality of that writing. So let's also focus now on audience. Knowing the audience is important. Every task that we give for nonfiction, whether it's explicit or implicit, will have an audience in mind. And we need to make sure students understand how to effectively address and engage that, that audience. Uh, as we've said on the slide here, context is key. So students need to make it clear who they're writing to, that they're aware of that audience. Uh, three main points here is, first of all, do not allow students, no matter who the audience is, to use slang or text speak when they're writing. What we want is form, kind of for more formal writing, even if the person they're writing to 
is familiar to them. So for example, if we're getting them to write an, uh, a letter to a cousin or an email to a friend, you can always tell students, look, the friend is a posh person. We're not going to start talking as if we're literally talking. We want to be using high level vocabulary, a correct sentence structure to ensure we can show off our writing. And that's really, really important. We also want students to understand the audience themselves so they could perhaps uh, draw a mind map of the audience's interest to depending on who they are. And obviously this can be stereotypical and generalized. But if, for example, they're writing to the elderly, then the things that they'll be writing about will be very different from a teenage audience. And if they're writing to a teenage audience, perhaps they might mention gaming, they might mention um, school because teenagers obviously go to school, whereas the elderly, they might talk about grandchildren, retirement. And so again, mind mapping uh, key words as well as key interests may help them in the writing um, for a particular audience. Uh, finally, provide models uh, for students as well. Show them how it works. And uh, as we've talked about in many of the sessions, modeling is key. Showing them a model, it kind of empowers the students to see how it should look on the page and therefore how they can access that themselves. Okay, so as well as um, audience recognition, one of the other key factors in persuasive writing is the voice, finding your voice. And, and by voice, we mean a perspective um, or even an emotional state that we want to be writing in. So encourage your students to write as a character as well as as themselves. Now, there will be times for them to be writing as themselves when we want their particular view. But often what we want isn't their view. We want their writing, uh, their writing style and the content. And sometimes that can be hindered by the student's own personal opinions, even their own personality. If, for example, we're writing about uh, prisons and uh, whether or not prisons are a, a kind of an effective or ineffective thing, many students may say, I don't know anything about prisons, nor am I interested. Same with other topics. But what we need to say to students is your character is you're going to be a character. And by uh, kind of becoming that person, you're then able to become more passionate uh, because that's what we want to get students away from their own personal opinions, hindering their writing, because what we're after is that writing. So what you could do is provide a, a drop down selection of characters they could choose and making sure that they are restricted and appropriate. But for example, a concerned mother would probably be far more passionate about uh, technology and the impact it's having on young people than perhaps they would. Uh, a business owner, uh, they could be um, someone specific like a gardener. They could be, if they are meant to be a teenager, say, yes, you are a teenager, but perhaps you're a teenager who travels a lot and you have, uh, you, you have that experience. So by enabling students to take on a character, they're then able to take on a voice and that voice then can have a particular slant or emotion that we want them to write with. So develop students ability to craft their writing through emotional states. So for example, you may say, right, I want you to write this and you're furious. You know, you are enraged by this particular topic. Get that rage out on the page. And when they put the rage on the page, all of a sudden their writing will become more lively, more passionate uh, and therefore better than just balanced or informative. Uh, that's what we want to get out of students is we want their personality on the page or someone else's personality on that page. You can say, I want you to be passionate about this. I want you to be inspiring about this topic. Uh, and that should then help us uh, with students crafting their writing and taking it up to the next level, which is what we're aiming for. So on the screen here, we have an example, a model of what it might look like for students to take on a particular voice or character. So in the yellow box here, uh, we've said that this is an older person. Perhaps they have teenage children. Uh, they're a professional and they're very traditional. So their views are, are very conservative. So we could then provide students with this or we could just show them this model and then show them what it would therefore look like. So in this example where we've got 74 hours, that's how long my son spent on his beloved iPhone last week. Straight away, what we're establishing is the, the anger, the, the, the um, agitation of the character, but also phrases like my son cause us to think, okay, well, this is someone who's personally invested. 
um, of all the Shakespearean plays that could have been devoured, all the homeless that could have been nourished, all the medical breakthroughs that could have been, my boy played Candy Crush. So we're getting a sense of sarcasm and cynicism through the voice of the character rather than a balanced um, kind of third person view of uh, technology and its impact. And that's what we really want to get across is we're not, unless we've asked them to, just writing to inform. We're writing to persuade. And the best way to persuade is through personality, through liveliness. And so this is an example that you could show to students. Uh, you could give them the characters and scaffold them out into creating their own characters from a more restricted um, drop down list that you give them. So as we discussed when we were looking at creative writing, so narrative and descriptive, planning is so important. And we need to make sure that the planning they're doing is purposeful, uh, it's detailed, but not restrictive. Um, and so planning is a non-negotiable. We need to be uh, training our students uh, with the muscle memory of planning, where the in an ideal world, not that we're there yet, um, when students begin writing persuasively, they are automatically planning without us having to tell them to do so. That's the dream. Uh, so how do we get there? Well, one thing we can do is use collaborative learning structures to build the confidence of the students because initially they won't want to plan. Uh, they don't know how to plan, but if they've got people next to them, they've got other brains they can be drawing from and therefore that might make the exercise more engaging for those students. Uh, you could provide planning grids so rather than having students start from scratch give them grids which could have specific information already there or questions you want them to explore uh, and by doing that then we can scaffold them into independent planning as they construct their transactional writing finally um, ensure these plans are detailed but not debilitating so we do want them to be putting lots of information in but so often we see students who've written a plan and that plan may as well be the actual piece of writing and you think well why, why have you done that so we want them to learn to kind of plan shorthand that the plan is for them but also that there's enough detail that they've got um, something to say when they actually come to write it and do stress the importance of planning show them evidence of um, students who've planned and the work they've reduced versus perhaps students who haven't. So you could do what a good one looks like, what a bad one looks like in terms of both planning and what's produced. Okay, so the features of persuasive writing then. Um, now, this is something that, um, you know, there's a lot of debate about as to the acronyms we should be using uh, for persuasive writing. And there are lots out there and some are great and some are bad and some are ugly um but what we really want to do is yes use these so for example on the screen here we've got De Forest, which is kind of a standardized version uh, and there are kind of our, our what we would consider key persuasive features it's not an exhaustive list there's more than this um, but these are kind of the go-to ones. So direct address, so using the word you to focus on the audience or we to kind of include us. Alliteration, uh, facts and opinions, rhetorical question, emotive language, statistics and triples or otherwise known as the rule of three. Um, I think personally, this is a pretty good list to use, but I have seen strange ones, some that don't even make sense. So you'll have students saying, don't forget to use your P of like, ever, you, you know, just a range of consonants and you think well how will they ever learn that some that are far too long and it therefore becomes inaccessible uh, and others which are just reinventing the wheel and you think well why wouldn't you use this so what i would advise is keep the teaching of these techniques consistent and systematized throughout the department so whatever you decide whether it's trust wide or academy wide make sure that everybody's using the same list that everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet otherwise we're just going to cause confusion for students. So do make sure that whatever list you're using, and that, like I've said, this is a good one to go with, that that is something that's consistent and in the need to know book and everywhere else that they see. Remembering as well that these are helpful aids. They are not a list of criteria. The problem for a lot of teachers is this is something that we can kind of grasp onto as something in a subject which is very abstract. This is a concrete thing. And so this is our go to often. Oh, I can teach these uh, and I can use it as a list of criteria. Um, some people even say I want two facts, three opinions, one statistic. This can be restrictive. And yes, we want to teach these techniques, but they shouldn't be the main focus of our teaching of persuasive writing. They are not the be all and end all of persuasion. And so, yes, use them, have them in the background, have them consistently there, but don't make them the main focus. Don't have 
a lesson on alliteration and a lesson on opinions. They would have done that in primary school, hopefully. What we want to do is take them onto the next level and teach them how to use them. So I'll now show you some ideas we can use to teach these features. Okay, so in terms of teaching these features, I've put on the screen here what our goal is really as teachers, and that is for our students to interweave persuasive features seamlessly, rather than shoehorn them clumsily into their writing. And unfortunately, the latter is what's often the case, that students will remember, I need to use a statistic, and they just kind of shove it into their writing. And it means their writing can become fragmented, uh, it can become clumsy, uh, and it becomes cluttered. And what we really want is want that kind of seamless, flowing, natural writing style from students. And that is quite difficult to achieve, but there are some ways we can do it. So what you can do is provide initial success criteria along with exemplars and live modeling. So we want them to be immersed in sophisticated writing. Show them what it looks like. Show them that it isn't a case of looking at a list of features and just ticking them off, but show them how, uh, how we can be um, flowing in our writing. And by the more you show them of live modeling and exemplars, the more that will become natural to students because it becomes part of the class culture. Also expose them to vocabulary and phrases they can use. So key phrases, just key words that you, we can use as springboards, not cages. So what I mean by that is you don't say you must use this and this word must be in it and this particular technique. That can become a cage for students. It restricts them in what they actually want to say and it can become a stumbling block for students rather than a springboard. And we want these words, these phrases to push them forward. So often when you have a student who's writing and they get stuck, a simple phrase, um, a keyword will then boost them into writing the next part. Finally, you can equip students with cultural capital they need. So many of our students don't have this cultural capital and so they can't access the questions. If we have a question about global warming and they know nothing about it, they'll feel intimidated. Even though we tell them it doesn't have to be realistic, uh, they'll still feel intimidated. So we can actually provide this for students and it will allow them then to access that question. And another thing you can do is of course have debates in class and then they'll listen to their peers and have more information to start writing to. Now obviously cultural capital is something very difficult to teach. It's something that's learned over time uh, and it's something that's often part of culture. It's, it's part of uh, family life, but there are ways we can kind of begin to bring it in. So for example, we have some of these in our schemes, but here's a, uh, some cultural capital information on society and what we'd give them are key terms. So words like gender, capitalism, ageism. We might go through those with students. They'll know some, they won't know all and say, look, these are key words you could use. Again, not as prisons, but as springboards. Give them a list of like a short list of key facts that might be relevant that they could use, but do remind them, look, your facts do not have to be real. In fact, that can be a problem. Just make them sound realistic, not necessarily real. But again, students may feel restricted or at least not uninspired. So what you can do is give them key facts. So for example, 40% um, of the world's population are not religious, may be useful for a particular task. And also interesting because our job as teachers isn't just to equip them with the content, but we have a job as well to kind of inform them as well. And this can be one way of increasing students' cultural capital, um, particularly on specific topics that will be coming up in our schemes. Okay, so finally, creating and sustaining engagement. How do we increase students' enjoyment of nonfiction writing when traditionally it's what they see as dry and dull? They often want to gravitate towards uh, descriptive and narrative writing, and we need to find ways in for them. Uh, now, the problem is often students find it dry and dull because we find it dry and dull. And uh, students' enjoyment of a particular topic is in direct proportion to the teachers. If we're passionate about something, that passion is contagious. And we need to find ways in for ourselves to enjoy nonfiction writing so that then the students can enjoy it. So first, make sure the topics you choose are relevant and interesting. Don't just choose generic topics, uh, things that you know won't be interesting to yourself or students, but things like gaming or body image can be used um, and get to know what your students are interested in as well. If you know there's a specific topic that they enjoy, bring that into the argument. 
use current news stories, things that they'll be hearing about. Um, use things like class debates so you can use the students' opinions, um, use class value lines so that students are kinetically engaging um, in these things. Uh, use interactive media, so use film clips, uh, use clips of speeches, use tweets from famous people that you can then uh, use as a springboard into a discussion and also develop cross-curricular link links. And this can be really interesting. So use a history teacher or a geography teacher, um, have them uh, come into the class and you can debate with them or find out what they're doing in history. And if it's something relevant, use that as well so that you can not have to spend a long time teaching them the cultural capital, but they'll already have that because they studied Nazi Germany and they know the impact of, of racism, whatever else it might be. So do look around you, you know, use, what's outside the classroom and allow what's outside the classroom to inform what's going on inside the classroom. And therefore then engagement will become something that develops naturally. Okay, thank you so much for taking part in this session. Um, I hope that uh, at least some of it will have been relevant and useful for you. Do please make contact with myself or any of the director team if there's any resources that you feel will be important. If you have any questions or queries about anything we've run through in this session or other sessions. Um, and thank you again for, for taking part.